morning. Um, we're looking forward to diving into God's Word together. You can go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 15. We'll be there very soon. One of the highlights of my life is the opportunity I get to coach my kids in sports. I have three children. I have a, an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, a 4-year-old, and they play all the sports, and I coach some of them, and I really, really enjoy it. I'm coaching my four-year-old. Her, her first sport that she gets to play is right now, and it's t-ball, and I'm getting to coach her in t-ball. There she is up there. Uh, she's the best player on the team, prettiest one. Uh, uh, anyway, I get to coach her, and it is fantastic. Now, when you're coaching t-ball, when you're coaching t-ball, the first thing that you got to teach them is you got to teach them to keep their eye on the ball. A lot of you have played t-ball before, I see. And keep your eye on the ball. And, you know, uh, we're, we're in the midst of a t-ball tournament this weekend, of all things, a t-ball tournament. Uh, and and we're, man, we got the championship game coming up this afternoon. We should all go. It'd be great. Let's all go and cheer on the diamonds today. Uh, but yesterday I was out at the ballpark and my kid is out there. We put the four-year-olds in the outfield because they'll get hurt by a line drive in the infield. We got them in the outfield and I'm, I'm standing out there in the outfield helping them, reminding them, keep your eye on the ball. Point to that big yellow ball. Do you see it? Where is it? Point to it. Um, and they're, they're doing their best to pay attention. But then somebody in the crowd over here starts playing loud music. And so uh, not my daughter who was here, but this other little girl is over here, and she hears the music, and she can't help it, and she starts dancing, and so I uttered something that I never thought I would utter on a ball field in all of my life. I said, you can dance if you want to, but you got to keep your eye on the ball. Because look, if you, if you miss the ball, if you're not looking for the ball, you miss everything. You, you miss the point of the game. It doesn't matter if you have the best glove and you spent the most money on a bat and your uniform looks the sharpest. It doesn't matter if you have the best dance moves. If you miss the ball, you miss the whole thing. And I'm afraid this morning that there may be some of us here online that might be missing the whole thing. So we've had the opportunity over the last couple of weeks, we've been walking through a little section of the Gospel of Mark, and we began in Bethany where Jesus was prepared for burial. And we moved last week to Gethsemane where Jesus experienced agony in the garden, and now we're going to move to Golgotha where Jesus is crucified. Look with your Bibles in me, with me. Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 21. God's word says, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. 
And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. And Father, we turn to your word and we ask that you would help us to see. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we read this story in Mark 15, and it's a story that I'd wager most of us, all of us, are familiar with. And that can be a great danger to be so familiar with something because you can miss some important details. And those important details may be the whole point. As we look at Mark chapter 15, we find that at Golgotha, God was accomplishing his divine plan of salvation through judgment. God was accomplishing his divine plan of salvation through judgment. God was accomplishing his plan. You know, none of what took place here at Golgotha on this this hill where Jesus was crucified None of what took place here was an accident. God is not whimsical. Think about the implications of that, that God is not whimsical. He doesn't decide what to do at the last minute. He doesn't react in real time, like finding out information from different people and then choosing what he will do. He is measured. He is weighed. He is decided. And at Golgotha, God acts. And Mark chapter 15 contains a heap of allusions to Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is kind of the background for Mark 15. And the easiest way to see that is Jesus' quotation of Psalm 22. Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a quotation of Psalm 22. But there are some other things as well, some some allusions like like the casting of lots for Jesus' garments, that's Psalm 22, or or the the wagging of the heads of the passers-by, that is an allusion to Psalm 22. And we could spend a long time looking into the details and and asking some really important questions that we could learn a lot from. Like, why was Psalm 22 on Jesus' mind? Why did he quote that psalm of all things? Or we could look into it and we could learn about the nature of suffering. Like King David wrote Psalm 22 and he suffered like this and said these things. And and then Jesus, he, he quoted Psalm 22 and suffered in these ways. So what does that mean for my suffering and how I'm allowed to respond and how I should respond? We could ask all of those questions, but we're not gonna do it. Instead, we're just going to highlight the fact that the crucifixion is according to plan. It's according to plan. That means that Golgotha was the plan of God from the beginning. You know, the Old Testament is not just like a prediction book where we're supposed to try to figure out what it's predicting, nor is it something that's irrelevant that we should just unhitch ourselves from because it doesn't matter anymore. That's not what the Old Testament is. The Old Testament lays for us the beginning of this story and it creates a pattern for us to understand what Jesus has come to do. That's what Psalm 22 does for Mark 15. The events of Golgotha, it shows us that God is not whimsical. He has planned the cross from the beginning. The cross is not something that happened to Jesus, like he's a sailboat that just puts its sail up and lets the wind blow it wherever. But rather, he's got his hand on the rudder, and he steers directly toward his chosen destination. It was the will of God for Jesus to die. That was the plan. But why was that the plan? 
I said a second ago that God's plan is salvation through judgment. God's plan is salvation through judgment. Mark tells us that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus came to save us from our sins. We can't save ourselves, and so Jesus came. And we know that the way Jesus came to save us was, for, was by dying on the cross for our sins. But how does that make sense? How does that make sense? Why does dying on the cross save us from our sins? Well, the answer is salvation through judgment. You know, God is holy, and holy God demands justice for sin. He will not sweep sin under the rug. God will not wink at our sin. God doesn't giggle at our sin with us. Oh, that's just the way I am. You know me. Sin deserves justice. Sinners deserve judgment. That is the promise of the Bible from the beginning. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, one of the first things God says to them is, cursed are you. Sin will be punished. Judgment from God is a promise of the Bible from the opening pages to the very last pages. And we see this theme of judgment in Mark 15 in a few places. The first one that I see, you can look in verse 33, it says that there was, uh, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. This is a supernatural darkness. It's not a, a, a darkness that was to be expected. It was a supernatural darkness. And in the Bible, when you see supernatural darkness, you should think judgment. An example of that, you know the story of, um, of Egypt and the Exodus, right? You know, that, you know this story the, that the people of Israel are in bondage in Egypt and, and they cry out for God to save them and so God sends a deliverer. He sends Moses and Moses goes and stands before Pharaoh. He says, uh, God says let my people go but Pharaoh has a hard heart and he, he says no. So what does God do? God begins to send a series of plagues and you've got gnats and you've got boils and you've got frogs and you've got blood water. What was one of the other plagues? Darkness. Darkness over the whole land. There's darkness. It is judgment. God is judging his enemies. And so when you see uh, this supernatural darkness in the Bible, you've got to think judgment, but you don't just think judgment. There's one other thing. Think about the story of, of the Exodus. God didn't just judge his enemies, the Egyptians. What did he do? He judged his enemies, and in that judgment, through that judgment, he saved his people. His people walked through the Red Sea on dry ground, headed for the promised land. God saved his people by judging his enemies. That's the symbol of darkness for us. Judgment is about to come. And at Golgotha, There are two, at least two, objects of God's judgment. The first thing that I see that God judged is the temple. God judged the temple at Golgotha. In verse 38, it tells us that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, the curtain in the temple was not like the curtains at your house. Um, those might be difficult to tear with your bare hands, but this, this temple... Now, this curtain at the temple, the veil, was, was more of a partition. It was almost a wall. It couldn't be easily torn or cut with a pair of scissors. And the fact that this veil was torn it is a miraculous thing, but also it tells us that it was torn from top to bottom, indicating there's only one person responsible for the tearing of the veil. That's God himself. And the tearing of the veil tells us God is saying, I'm destroying the veil because I'm going to destroy the temple. And why was God going to destroy the temple? Because the temple is no longer needed. You know, the, the temple, for the Old Testament believers, the, the temple was the place where God manifests his presence. If you wanted to go be near God, that's where you would go. That's where God was. And you needed your sins forgiven, 
You would go to the temple, bring your sacrifice, have your sin forgiven. If you needed your relationship to be made right with God, you needed to go to the temple to do that. The temple is destroyed. Jesus said over and over in the Gospels, everything's changing. The temple is gonna go away. Everything is changing. The temple would be destroyed. The old way of doing things was gonna go away because it's no longer needed. Jesus himself is becoming the temple. You want your relationship with God to be right? You don't go to the temple, you go to Jesus. You need your sins forgiven, you go to Jesus. He is the one who offers the sacrifice. He himself is the sacrifice that is offered for sin. The old way of doing things is going away. God judged the temple at Golgotha. That's not the only thing he judged. The other thing God judged at Golgotha is a bit more shocking. You see, at Golgotha, God judged his own son. Jesus cried out in verse 34, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there's a lot of different interpretations on what does that exactly mean? And how does that exactly work? And I don't want to take any time diving into that. What I want to do is zoom out. And Jesus' cry of anguish here is a cry because he has lost something. He was experiencing pain and suffering, and he needed his father, but his father wasn't there. If after the service Today, one of you comes up to me and says, I never want to see you and I never want to talk to you again. That would hurt my feelings. But if after the service today, my wife says to me, I never want to see you again or talk to you again, that would be devastating. Because the longer the love, the deeper the love, the greater the pain of its loss. And for this moment on the cross, The son lost his father. The father has always been and the son has always been. There's never been a time when the father and son were not. They had always loved one another in this love relationship. They had always had communion. And in some way and somehow on the cross right here, Jesus is experiencing something that had never been. There was some kind of separation. There had never been separation. There had never been fracture. There had never been silence. But here at Golgotha, the relationship was somehow in some way severed because God was judging his son. Why? Was it for crimes that he had done, that he groaned upon the tree? No. There's no sin in him. Instead, what's happening is what the Apostle Paul explains in 2 Corinthians 5. That at Golgotha, God made the one who knew no sin to be sin. Jesus, who knew no wickedness, became the very vile thing that God intends to judge. Our sin is transferred to Jesus so that he faces the penalty as if he is the one who is guilty. The father pours out wrath on his own son. The father judges his own son for the sins of the world. And in this way, God is bringing about salvation. It is salvation through judgment. We gain access to the Father through the cross and the suffering of Christ. We gain the forgiveness of sins through his sacrifice. We no longer have to pay the penalty of sin because Jesus paid it all. We are saved through judgment. And on that day, on that cross, on that hill called Golgotha, Jesus experienced our judgment day. The wrath we deserve, the judgment we deserve, the separation that we deserve. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And no answer came, but but the answer would have been something like, well, I've forsaken you so I don't have to forsake my people. 
And so this tells us that what happened at the cross was not just tragedy. It wasn't the Romans just executing another criminal. It wasn't just some man dying. What happened at the cross was judgment. At Golgotha, God was accomplishing his divine plan of salvation through judgment. And that's an important detail for us to get. But if we miss that detail, we miss everything. Look, look, this whole thing is easy to miss. All all of these events took place in public. Everybody saw Jesus die on the cross. There's the story in in Luke of the men on the road to Emmaus. You know the story. After Jesus has risen from the dead, spoiler alert, Jesus rises from the dead. You still gotta come to church next week. Uh, after that happens, they're walking down the road to Emmaus, these two guys, and, and Jesus shows up, they don't recognize him, and he's, he's like, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, all the things that have taken place. And Jesus says, what things? And they say, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know what happened over the weekend? Everybody knew what had happened. Jesus was crucified. It was the talk of the town. The same, as, the same thing's true in our day, isn't it? Everybody knows. Everybody knows that. It's Holy Week. It's gonna be in the newspaper. It's gonna be online. Everybody's gonna hashtag he is risen. Everybody knows that. But even though they see it, they don't perceive it. Even though they, they hear it, they don't understand. Otherwise, they would turn and be forgiven. It's spiritual blindness. In Mark 15, there are two groups of people who missed it. The first one is in verses 29 and 30. You can glance down and see the passers-by. The passers-by missed it. You know, uh, scholars don't really know where Golgotha was, like where, where is it exactly, which hill are we talking about. There's a traditional spot, there's a, there's a popular alternative, but there's not 100% certainty. But what we do know is that it was some hill located outside the city in a, in a high traffic area. They executed people on like a highway, and it's on purpose. The reason the Romans did that, they had to rule their empire with an iron fist. They couldn't put up with any sort of rebellion, and so what they would do is they would have these very public executions as if to say, this is what happens if you oppose the Romans. As a matter of fact, uh, this when it says that there were two robbers crucified on either side of him, that word is more like um, insurrectionists, rebels. This is what happens if you oppose Rome. And so Jesus is crucified on like a highway. Everybody's walking by, anybody can see it. There's these passers by. And those who passed by wagged their heads and said, save yourself, come down from the cross. Do you see the irony in that statement? They don't know what they're asking. What, what happens if Jesus comes down from the cross? What happens if Jesus decides that he doesn't want to do this anymore? He had the power to do that. You know, at, at Jesus' trial, he reminds everybody, he says, all I have to do is say the word, snap my fingers, and thousands of angels will come to my aid. Don't you think the angels were probably hoping for that? They're up in heaven, and Jesus is being mocked and beaten and tortured. He's the son of God, and they're saying, please just say the word. I got this. Just say the word. But he didn't. And when Jesus was arrested, the whole company of people, a couple of hundred, show up to arrest Jesus. And they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am. And they all fall over backwards on their backs at just the word. It's like Jesus was flexing his muscle for just a second, and then he says, take me away. (laughs) He lets them arrest him. And so these people, these passers-by are mocking him. Come down from the cross. What happens if he does? The judgment that was supposed to fall on Jesus doesn't, and instead falls on us. The very thing they're asking for is the very thing that dooms all of us. They don't know what they're asking. Come down from the cross. The text says that they derided him. That that word is is actually, it's blasphemed him. They blasphemed him. Did you know that that was the religious crime that Jesus was guilty of? You can look back in Mark 
chapter 14, they, they, they asked him, uh, the, the high priest said to Jesus, are you the son of God? And finally, he just is straightforward, and he says, I am. And the chief priest says, well, what further evidence do we need? He's guilty of blasphemy. He deserves to die. So Jesus was accused of blasphemy, but here he's dying on the cross, and the passers-by, they are actually blaspheming. They're guilty of the thing he's accused of doing. They're the ones who deserve death. But there he is dying on the cross for the sins of the world. They were there. They saw the whole thing, but they completely missed it. Well, there's a second group of people who missed it. It's the religious leaders. You can see that in verses 31 and 32. The chief priests with the scribes mocked Jesus. He saved others, he can't save himself. In other words, he did all these miraculous things. He, he healed people, he raised people from the dead. He did all these incredible things, but he can't save himself. So they exclaim, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Do you see the irony there? These were religious leaders. They knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. They had huge chunks of it memorized. They knew it, but they didn't know it. They knew church. They knew the Bible, but they didn't know God. You hear me? They heard, but they didn't understand. See, the Old Testament presents for us God's servant who was gonna come institute a new covenant, and he was gonna die in the place of his people. They should have known it was coming. They should have known it was him, and they didn't. And they're demanding, come down from the cross, and then we'll believe you. Would they have believed if he came down from the cross? There was another time that these religious leaders asked Jesus for a sign to prove he was the Christ. And Jesus told them, you have Moses and the prophets. You don't need anything else. In other words, you have the Bible. Why won't you believe that? Shouldn't that be enough? And then he said, if you won't believe the scripture, you wouldn't believe even if someone rose from the dead. See, if Jesus came down from the cross, their sins couldn't be forgiven, but they wouldn't have believed anyway. It seemed like everyone seemed to miss it. The religious people, the general populace, the whole world seemed to believe the same thing. But just because something is popular doesn't mean it's right. And just because the whole world thinks something doesn't mean it's true. Just because something is on the right side of history doesn't mean it's godly. You know, as Christians, we've been on the wrong side of history from the very beginning. It was a Roman cross on Golgotha. But Rome is dead and Jesus is fine. Notice that the whole world seems to believe one thing. Well, Actually, not the whole world. There's one unlikely person who didn't miss it. His eyes were opened, and he makes this bold, ironic proclamation. The passers-by mock Jesus. The religious people mock Jesus. But there's only one truth teller in this whole text. There's one. It's in verse 39. Of all the people at Golgotha, who is the one who sees? It's the Roman centurion. A Roman centurion is named such because he has the command of a hundred Roman soldiers. He is a ruthless military commander. He didn't gain his commission by knowing the right people or being voted in. He earned his commission by being a Roman soldier and working his way to the top. He was a killing machine in charge of a hundred other killing machines. He was battle tested. He was in charge of this crucifixion. He was in charge of other crucifixions. He had done this before many times. It was bloody, it was gory, it was disgusting. He was a Roman soldier. So you have the religious leaders probably holding their Bibles and wearing a tie. 
mocking Jesus. You have the general populace walking by just making fun of Jesus. They saw the whole thing happen, but they didn't perceive. What did the centurion say? Truly this man was the son of God. You know, in all of Mark's gospel, nobody else calls Jesus the son of God. Nobody. It's just this centurion, a religious outsider, an unclean Gentile, a brutal killing machine. He's the only buddy who sees it. My question is, what caused him to see it? Well, the text tells us. We don't have to guess. We can look. It says in verse 39, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. When he saw the way that Jesus died, that convinced him. When he saw that this was not the death of a criminal, that convinced him. This was not the death of some loser. He was convinced. What did he see in Jesus? What did he see? He saw victory. He saw victory. See, the cross is not a time for us to come together and feel sorry for Jesus. That's not what Mark does in his account as we read Mark 15. He doesn't go over all the gory details for us to feel sad about Jesus. We don't get those details. This isn't the defeat of Jesus. This is the faithfulness of Jesus. This is the victory of Jesus. He was mocked by the crowd. Come down from the cross. In one sense, I'm sure he wanted to. When he, when he went to pray before the cross, remember his prayer. Father, take this cup from me. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. If there's another way, can we please do that? But not my will, but yours be done. This wasn't his first choice, but he knew the task. He knew the mission. He knew that his death would be the ransom for many. He knew that he would die so that the many could be forgiven, and so he stayed. And before Jesus died, Mark Mark records in verse 37, it says, Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. What kind of cry is it? A a, A cry of pain? A cry of anguish? Sadness, frustration, what what kind of cry was this? You know, when a man was crucified, he's very quickly drained of energy and strength. So that when he died, he did not have the strength to cry out in pain or something. When a man died of crucifixion, they just died. But this shows us that nobody took Jesus' life. He laid it down of his own accord. He went out on his own terms. And when he cried out, it was not a cry of pain or anguish or frustration or sadness. It was a cry of victory. This is verified by John's gospel. He tells us what words Jesus said when he cried out. You know what they are? It is finished. This was a victory shout. The centurion saw that, and he knew, oh, this is different. He had seen hundreds of criminals crucified before. Oh, no, this one's different. This was not a time to feel sorry for the defeated Jesus. This was a time to worship at the victory of Jesus. Jesus' victory is his faithfulness to the end. And that's the demand that he makes on his followers. You want to be a follower of Jesus in this room online? You want to be a follower of Jesus? Faithfulness to the end. The last book of the Bible is is Revelation. And one of the themes in that book is victory, overcoming. But it's kind of weird. Like the way that it's described, victory is described, it's like sticking with Jesus even if you die. Even if you lose everything, you never quit on Jesus. Victory, overcoming, is sticking with Jesus no matter what, even if it costs your life, even if it costs you everything. Here in the text, Jesus sets the pace, and we're called to take up our crosses and follow, even if we lose everything, even if we're outsiders, even if we're told that, well, you're just on the wrong side of history now. We follow Jesus to the point of death. God help us. 
Do you see? Do, do you see? Do you understand? We're all here at church. You read this. You were listening unless you were asleep. We, we read this together. You know Jesus died on the cross. You know. But do you see? Do you see? What evidence do you have that you see? How, how does your life reflect the fact that you see? Do you see? Well, Mark 15 doesn't end with Jesus on the cross. Jesus is buried and Joseph of Arimathea is a member of the council who had crucified, uh, who had, uh, he's a member of the council and he asked for Jesus' body and he takes Jesus' body and he puts it in a tomb that was cut out of the rock and the Bible says that he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Matthew's gospel says that the Jews were worried that, that Jesus' disciples would steal Jesus' body and then tell everybody he rose from the dead. And so Pilate orders protection over the tomb. And, and Matthew says that, that Pilate says, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. That's the funniest verse in the whole Bible. So Jesus is dead, Jesus is buried. There were two men in an art gallery staring at a painting. And in the painting there is a, a man playing chess against the devil. The title of the painting is Checkmate. The devil has won. The devil's opponent has no more moves. The king has been put in a position where it doesn't matter where he's moved, it's over, he's lost. And these two men are looking at this painting and one kind of moves on to the next thing, the other one's standing there staring at the painting. He's really interested because he's an international chess champion, he just kind of wanted to see kind of the board and the moves of it and wanted to see what was going on and all of a sudden he's shocked. And he calls his friend back over. Come here, look at this. His friend's wondering what's going on. He says, it's wrong. The, the painting is wrong. We, we've got to tell the artist he can't call this checkmate anymore. The guy doesn't know what's going on. What, what do you mean? He says, the king has one more move. It, Jesus was put on trial. He's mocked, he's beaten, he's reviled, he's crucified, he's buried, and it seems like evil has won. Checkmate. But it's wrong. The king has one more move. I want y'all to listen to me real close. I'm gonna give you some directions. Next week, we're about to celebrate that. We're not there yet. It's still, it's still... Golgotha here. But next week, we're going to come celebrate Easter together. The king has one more move. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to invite your friends. And you're going to invite your neighbors and your coworkers and the person that you get your soda from the gas station. You're going to invite them to come too. And you're going to park far away so new people can park close. And you're going to sit close and let new people sit in the seats that you really like sitting in way back there away from the front. And you're gonna sing loud at the top of your lungs and we're gonna celebrate together what Jesus has done. But this morning, I don't want you to miss it. At Golgotha, God was accomplishing his divine plan of salvation through judgment. The question this morning is how will you respond? Will you assume you're good because you've been in church and you know the deal? Will you assume you're good because I'm a pretty good person, I don't really do bad stuff, so I should be good, right? Or will you examine yourself to see if you're in the faith? Do you, do you trust in Jesus to save you from your sin? Do you, do you really? He has died on your behalf. He has died in your place. He has received the penalty of God's wrath so you don't have to. Trust in Jesus today. Don't miss it.